Good day and welcome to Science and Nature. My name is Andrew Hebda. I'll be your host today. As a guest, we have, um, well, what can one say? Uh, the program being Science and Nature, uh, obviously we, we look for people with interesting stories and interesting backgrounds and themes both within science and or nature and or mixtures of both. Over the last several years under the uh, guise of a program previously referred to as Science is Your World, we've had as our guest Mr. Gilbert Van Ricker Vorsel of Aquamarine Photography. Uh, Mr. Van Ricker Vorsel is Perhaps uh, I would have to say one of the one of the greatest world class underwater photographers uh, of our time, and he shared with us many of his uh, many of his both experiences as well as themes and topics of interest, things that are close to his heart. And uh, Gilbert is back with us today to uh, share an additional uh, an additional uh, experience. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank what, you very much. What Gilbert's going to be talking to us, I hope is going yes. to be an exciting exercise, an exciting experience in dealing with tuna. Now tuna is something that of course we may see if we're uh, experienced fishermen and, uh, and have a few dollars to, to burn, or perhaps if we're in the Tokyo fish market we might see some of our local tuna there. However, rarely do we actually come across tuna in a natural habitat, in an aquatic situation. Uh, Gilbert has brought with, his, with him a, um, some uh, remarkable footage of both tuna swimming, feeding, interacting, and I uh, wish to share that with us. I'll be delighted. Um, it must have been in 1970 when I came in 1969 to Nova Scotia. And in 1970, um, one time I was reading in the newspaper about uh, something that happened um, that was a a small disaster to the fishing community on, in Fox Point, St. Margaret's Bay. And what had happened was that uh, the fishermen, all the fishermen of Fox Point and nearby uh, places, they specialized on um, providing the Japanese market with bluefin tuna. Mm -hmm. And uh, bluefin tuna have always been very prolific in St. Margaret's Bay, and uh, they would catch large numbers of them, and I probably they made a fish meal out of them. But when the Japanese discovered that they also taste very good, uh, and they make a, a, a food w uh, type with it, which is famous in Japan, it's called Chi, and uh, they make it from bluefin tuna. Uh -huh. So now suddenly bluefin tuna has become a almost religious uh, ceremonial food, and accordingly the price went Sky high. This was a good news, bad news story then. Good news, bad news story because uh, uh, those people, they, um, they were looking at this uh, very interesting development. They decided to go into a collective um, freezing plant and uh, accumulate sufficient uh, numbers of these fish so that a Japanese trawler would come in and then pick up 30, 40, 50,000 pounds of fish. Right. And uh, that would be a worthwhile uh, wait to come for. And what had happened, the freezing plant uh, had a breakdown in the cooling system. And uh, the whole lot of fish went, went wrong, you know. And uh, so it was a significant loss for the community. And uh, so then, they, this, then one of the fishermen, it was said in the article, had come up with the uh, solution to keep the fish alive. So they would catch the fish in mackerel traps as bycatch and then put them into a pound net that they would attach to the mackerel trap and accumulate tuna as they are caught over the period of time that the fishermen were catching, were uh, fishing for mackerel and herring yes. in St. Margaret's Bay. And uh, anyway, this. Um, this was just at the very beginning. And uh, when I read this article, I thought, gee, that's interesting. There's a fisherman who has bluefin tuna in a, in a pen. Yes. So I thought, I better check that out next day. And so I went there. <coughs> and out, I with, came out with a dry suit and the camera, was it? <laughs> um, not yet. I wasn't in photography yet at that oh, time. I, I wasn't, uh, this, this only started with that project later on. Um, what happened, I drive uh, on the on the road, which is right next to the water, and, and there were several Cape Island boats uh, on the, within uh, 
five, three, four hundred feet away from the shoreline. And um, there was one man, and he was standing on the bow with a harpoon, and his wife was uh, steering the boat, and the boat was going in a pattern. And, and what do I see? Uh, the, the fins of bluefin tuna coming out of the water, very close to the shore, actually. Yes. This is a huge fish. And at a certain moment, the man harpoons one of those fish, and he throws the line and a big orange ball behind it, and that line goes off with that ball bobs yes, almost out of sight with that huge tuna uh, speared onto it, you know. Anyway, this was very interesting to watch, and um, I, um, I then waited until I, I met some of the people that... Uh, uh, that were on the wharf, and uh, I got the information, and um, then I heard the story, and then I called a friend of mine, Charles Doucette, who was at that time uh, already a film producer and underwater photographer in Nova Scotia, and uh, he, int he eventually introduced me to uh, underwater photography. But I called Charlie, and uh, I said, you should come, because we have this bluefin tuna here, and uh, let's Let's go in with them, and uh, and you can shoot some great footage. Oh, yes. So that's how it got started, and uh, that is meanwhile 15, 16 years ago, and uh, ever since, that population of bluefin tuna has been uh, declining, um, and uh, for some unexplained reasons, they decline somewhere totally, and then they appear somewhere else. Uh, by maybe by chance because it's always there that they are here because of because of um, what you call the uh, the yeah. migrations of mackerel and herring yes. that they are following as they are coming up to the Gulf Stream yes. and so on and uh, so they are here only for a short period of time maybe um, three or four weeks in total or not not maybe not even that long and during that time you have to catch the bluefin tuna yes and. Uh, um, if the Gulf Stream drifts in to the, uh, in, into St. Margaret's Bay and then the wind change happens, then you get a cutoff of that warm water bell, yes. which brings in warm water species. And you will see later on in the program, you'll see some trigger fish that are particularly interesting yes. uh, as they are warm water fish from the southern Atlantic uh, that, that come up with the Gulf Stream. and. Uh, and get trapped in St. Margaret's Bay, and that's where I photographed them then. So this is where, uh, back in the late 70s, there was a, a big spurt of uh, tuna, and then they virtually disappeared then for the balance of the 80s. Then. Is that, uh... Uh, what happened then is uh, there was an American, who, uh, Mr. J. Edmund, who started a fisheries operation called Janelle Fisheries, yeah. and he, he got in touch with the Japanese market, and uh, he got the... Uh, uh, the idea to uh, start an aquaculture uh, experiment in which they would keep the bluefin tuna, feed them, and feed them. Uh, and they are, you know, they are big fish that need a lot of food to um, uh, to support their warm-blooded uh, metabolism. Yes, one of the few fish that actually maintains. A, That's right. Warm. Yeah. These, so these are the, these are. Uh, a result, uh, a down-the-road result of that uh, aquaculture enterprise, then. That's right. Well, no, no, I wouldn't say that. These are, these are members of the bluefin tuna population that frequents our coast, and that is a limited uh, population. There are, um, well, I don't know how many fish at the present time that they are estimating, but uh, the numbers are down to uh, maybe twenty thousand fish or thirty thousand fish or. That is a, that's actually when you look at the Atlantic, that is a uh, a small number. Yes. You know, it, there are still fisheries potential in there, but when you look at it from the point of view of the public here, we are interested in these magnificent fish because the bluefin tuna is one of the one of the five largest fish in the world ocean, mm -hmm. and it it is has been a prominent fish on our coast and. Now that the Japanese are paying so much money for them, uh, they are uh, putting a fishing pressure on them that will actually uh, run their, um, 
how I call it, their age group yes. uh, cohort, down. Yeah. You know, because these fish are on the average seven, eight hundred pounds, and go up to over a thousand pounds, and from from seven to ten feet uh, in length, they're enormous fish. Yes. And uh, they but, but those fish that you see there, they are twenty, twenty-five, thirty years old. Yes. And with the fishing pressure that we are having, that was on the Atlantic coast. I don't know anymore if it if it still is, but it goes. Uh, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, there is fishing pressure still on those fish everywhere because they are valuable fish, of course, you know. Although within within our the Canadian waters, that there is a limited the catch is limited to l literally several hundred animals. I think perhaps 300 or so. So yeah, yeah. The, well, the Department of Fisheries, end, yes. the Department of Fisheries has that ha puts uh, a quota on 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 how many fish can be caught in St. Margaret's Bay and elsewhere. Yes. Looking, um, looking, looking at the fish here. It's, this obviously this is a, an open water fish. This is almost a, a a deep sea type of a fish, judging by exactly looking at its. Uh, yeah, is that what you call a pelagic fish? Pelagic fish, yeah. Yeah, they are they are built for speed. They they swim in uh, in small groups behind the uh, swarms of uh, herring and mackerel and other fish that uh, form up in huge schools. Yes. And they plunge in those schools, and the schools just open up like one body, and they won't catch anything. They only hope to catch something that they can push out at the other side of the school. Uh -huh. I've seen them do it. You know, I've been in in such schools of mackerel, not and uh, and I would see the schooner, the the tuna swim through it. Uh, those were phenomenon that I experienced in the nets, in the mackerel traps in St. Marcus Bay, where you, you would have 50 or 60,000 pounds of mackerel uh, in a net, and you would have a number of bluefin tuna in, mixed in with them. Yes. And uh, the mackerel would still react to their main predator as they would react out in the, uh, in, in the open water. In the open waters, yeah. And you would see what that uh, reaction was, and it's awesome to see, because the tuna, even in a small environment where they have to swim so Yes. In a uh, in a net with only sixty or seventy feet uh, diameter, mm -hmm. uh, they still have to swim their five or six uh, miles an hour steady sweet, uh, steady speed because they need that to push that amount of water through their gills that provides them with the oxygen that uh, that a big body of a fish l like that needs. So this fish actually then it continuously is moving. You'll never see them sit lay, sitting on the bottom or laying always on moving. the bottom. Then, yes. It's always moving. Yes. And uh, uh, and they and the, the colder the water becomes, the more that metabolism needs to burn. Yes. And the, uh, accordingly, the fish are eating a lot in that cold water here. Maybe that is a reason why they would, in three or four months of captivity in a, in a net in St. Marcus Bay, they would. They could uh, increase in weight by 200 pounds. So fairly substantial. Yeah. The, uh, I assume then they run the mackerel. The mackerel traps are run uh, separately then for feed. How much would they be feeding on a on an annual on a, on a daily basis? Uh, they would feed them, uh, I believe, twice a day. Yes. Um, it's hard to say um, what the amount is, but. Uh, um, substantial amounts were being shoveled in, and you'll see. As they are doing that, while I'm in with the fish there, you'll see uh, at a certain moment uh, bunches of fish landing on the surface, and uh, that is in front of my camera. Yes. Um, and to bring the fish in sight, you know, yes. the, this of course is the uh, the net uh, perimeter around the uh, um, the tuna nets, yes. and uh, that is the uh, the boat of the fisherman who owns the net and the fish. And uh, some of those fishermen, in in well, last year and the year before, have been doing extremely well with the sudden return of bluefin tuna. Yes. Now these aren't bluefin tuna here. These are fish that come with the bluefin tuna. Um, those are uh, pelagic trigger fish, mm -hmm. and they are a a, um, um, a Gulf Stream species that comes up. Uh, from the southern Atlantic, where you see them very prominently everywhere. Um, and so this is actually a warm water fish which comes into Nova Scotian waters in the summer and is there every summer. I've seen them every summer around uh, Paddy's Head, 
um, near near Peggy's Cove there, and I've talked to a number of fishermen who who tell me about them, and I know exactly what they're talking about. Yes. So they are being they are being uh, seen and caught by fishermen all along the coast yes. at that period of time. You know? I see uh, young children catching them on on hook and line this this last this last year. And there's, notice there's quite a difference in how they propel themselves with the tuna. It seems to be very much yeah. just the tail, but here it's the the dorsal and the uh, oh yeah and the anal yeah. fin seem to be. Well, the tuna is a long, slender fish, yes. and this is a short, deep fish which uh, which has great. Uh, Maneuver maneuverability, maneuvers. but is not a fast swimmer. So this would actually seem to be probably more at home in coral reefs in the warmer climate yeah, than here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have uh, you have the queen trigger fish, which is an, uh, a very colorful, a uniquely um, uh, coral reef um, variety of yes. this uh, of of the trigger fish, and uh, the gray um, trigger fish, which these are. Uh, their coloration is not as as uh, uh, bright, but uh, their their motion, their their elegance, their their splendid. Uh, you know, the tail has such a uh, um, elegant shape. Yes. You know, it's just and the way they move. Uh, you, you'll see them in a moment when they're coming close up to me. Um, no, so I, one, this one's got those. Uh, they have these little spines on the. Just on the back of the head, I noticed that when they yeah. slow down, they seem to lift them up a bit. That is the that is the, that is the trigger, and then on the side, in in the base of the tail, they have they have a hidden a hidden knife too, which when they are attacked by by predators, they they'll set up that uh, th that spike uh, on top of their head, and uh, and then they use the uh, the tail to give. To, to give a predator a, a, a hit to hit him, oh, yes. and the knife is so so sharp that it will cut right in, cut right into their body too. And uh, so if you if you handle them, you have to watch out for that because their their tail will just nip you. Give and, you a, uh, and next is you have a a deep cut in your in your hand or I, arm. You know. I was reading somewhere that uh, in the Caribbean, of course, uh, be, because of what they feed on, that they actually accumulate a toxin. So down there, they don't they don't eat trigger fish there because they tend to be distasteful, or unpalatable, or perhaps a bit on the uh, yeah. the poisonous side. Well, as as I, I am aware of that, and um, apparently it depends on uh, on the presence of certain species that are that have tox toxic. Yes. Uh, agents in them that they might feed on, yes. and by their absence or by the timing yes. that uh, they come and go, yes. you can um, you can eat those species or you can't. Yes, you know. These are their their eyes are moving quite a bit. That's that seems yes, rather. Yes, yes, yeah. But they're such a neat fish. They are when they come close to you, they look at you, and uh, it is just amazing. But I mean, those those creatures are they, they have a. Um, they have a way. Uh, you see, there is um, um, a little bit of aggression or a little bit a of territory. Bit of, yeah, there is a there is a, a, a there is feeding um, jealousy there, just yes. just like your dogs. They, uh, the, the, this fish is the, probably the uh, the, uh, the bigger one, yes. uh, or the leading one, or the more aggressive one. And uh, they all have a they have a little pecking order going. But the fish looks at you, and uh, they trust you or distrust you, and you see that all happening when you observe them from, from two or three feet distance. Yes. You know, because I'm, what I do here is I, I, I catch a crab and I break them up, mm -hmm. and then the, uh, the, the scent of the um, of the juices of the crab attracts them because that is their, that is their natural food in the in in the, in the southern Atlantic. Yeah. The the other the other fish are keeping an eye on them, but when he turns to them, then they turn turn away too. So that's a, oh yeah, yeah, a, yeah. Interesting social interaction. That is right. Yeah. Uh, I I was looking at some photographs of of them, and of course many fish also they listen with the with the sides. They have that line, the lateral line, and usually it's the length of the fish along its side from where those that side fin is. Yes. But with trigger fish, evidently the line isn't straight, but rather it dips down. So it's actually almost twice as long as the length of the body. So in actual fact. It could potentially have twice as twice as much hearing ability really? as yeah. a, a, as another yeah. fish. Oh yeah! But look at how attentive it is there. It's a oh yeah, yeah. You see, though, those eyes are moving, and they, they, it's interesting. The eyesight of the fish, they can look forward, and then they see bifocally, like we yeah. can, 
but then they are they, they are also used to look uh, um, to look both ways um, fish to have a fish eye lens view yes and uh, that um, uh, gives them um, the whole space around them that yes. they can see also backwards um, oh, because yes. you see their eyes are coming out they're coming out sideways yeah quite uh, they're, they're, they're protruding a little bit yes and that allows the fish to look backward and forward they can see everything behind and in front and below and over them and when there is something interesting then they turn towards it and then yes. they can see bifocally yes and judge the distance and start feeding and that's something like that yeah. you know well, looking looking at the eyes though with a large forehead between and if we well, call it a the, the the forward the snout there um, it must have a fairly large blind area just in front there that I can't see though. Be uh, no, I can't see in stereo. I can certainly see with one eye at a time. So it must have this sort of two-phase two vision that uh, individual uh, appearance and then a nicely focused uh, two-dimensional, three-dimensional uh, image yeah. further up. That's the large one again? It's their, it's their particular um, uh, food that they uh, have a habit. Yes. And that probably through, through evolution shaped the uh, survival um, predominance that that became then the shape of the fish yes um, uh, you see them for example in the in the Caribbean you have these uh, uh, sea urchins with long the black sea urchins with oh, very yes. long spikes very long spines yeah mm -hmm. spines and uh, what these fish do they they uh, nip at those uh, um, quilts Yes. And uh, and finally get to the body of the um, of the sea urchin and crack it and uh, see it's interesting you see they spit something out and, and then they look at it again yes and then they spit it out again to have another look yes because it uh, doesn't look right or it doesn't oh, taste right yeah, perhaps oh that's yeah. right that that listens all very close yes. and uh, see you're doing you're doing it again yeah. and did, uh, did you ever see them uh, feeding on sea urchins here in in, in Saint Saint Margaret's Bay or Paddy? They are inspecting them. Uh -huh. They're inspecting them, yes. but uh, probably our sea urchins are too thick. In mm -hmm. uh, the scales are too thick, so yes. they adapt. They, they get used to something else, and then this is what these these creatures do. Yes, they get used to me after when you give them that time to get used to something. Mm -hmm. And each each of these uh, aquatic creatures have their own time to get used to something. And if you yes. know that. Then you just wait until it happens, and then they become very, um, they become very accepting. Oh know? yeah, that, that 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 makes sense. Yeah, um, in a year like we had in 1995, where the waters got warm and that the sea urchin disease came in, and essentially eliminated the majority of the sea urchins down to whatever the depth is, 40 feet or yeah. you know 12, 13 meters. Um, would that would you imagine that would have an effect on them here, or do you, or they just they just are not interested in sea urchins? As you say, it's not a it's not a preferred species, but uh. those creatures are used to the the program of uh, of the season. They just uh, gradually um, experiment into into a new species to feed on, and keep on feeding until that disappears and makes space for another species. Uh, that's their that's their routine. So they're yeah. opportunists then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is this is remarkable then and comparing the trigger fish then to the tuna, obviously the one being much more energetic and uh, and actively hunting down its food, whereas these ones being much more laid back, I guess if one could use that phrase, but uh, well, uh, the, the the tuna lives in the open water, and yes. these fish they they want to uh, they, they need to live close to the cover of rocks, yeah. you know. Yeah. And you see them returning to those rocks continuously yeah. because that's their that's their their safe haven. Do they show any interest in live animals? Well, they they are not. They're definitely looking at the lobster too. And actually, this lobster was feeding on some of the tidbits that fell down. Yes. And uh, and the triggerfish were were not interested in lobster because that is a species they they have no experience with. Mm, and I've never uh, seen it. And yeah, yeah. But they will they, they will go for lob for for crabs. You know. Yes. So, uh, crabs and fingers. Crabs and no. fingers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You have to really watch out because that you, you don't realize it, but if you think about it, that the shape of their of that that head makes a jaw that is uh, um, 
that is operated by a significant uh, muscle pack. Yes. And so their their jaw is very strong. Yes. And it needs to be because they're feeding on hard shelled mm -hmm. uh, sea creatures, and also their mouth is, is studded with. Um, Actual teeth, decent-looking teeth, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they are so they are so gregarious that when you feed them by hand, you really have to watch out because in their gregariousness, if the, if it, they, they, you know, you may have a hole in your in, in your mitt, yes, and they see your fingers sticking out, and they think, oh, let's try and bite in that. Yeah, interesting-looking things. Yeah. And uh, the nip is one that you feel. I can tell you that. I see. So this is as with uh, with other animals, um, the. Um, the uh, if they can get a fold of your skin inside their teeth, then uh, then uh, oh, yeah. you, they can make you feel it. Yeah. Well, you, you, you know, if you were, I've never been bitten by a lobster. Yes. I know people have been bitten by them, but that's their own mistake because if you uh, if you just hold your hand too close, and you don't know how how fast the animal is. Mm -hmm then you get bitten and uh, you may be on the real top of those guys. So both these species really in, their, in, in, in different ways are, are, are actually very, very, with respect to people, very, very relaxed, very calm, or perhaps that's, that's your, your bedside manner or your seaside manner. Well, it's, uh, what I have to do, for example, is to attract them. That when I have the, uh, the um, crab, then I have to shake the crab real, real fast. You see, I, I yes. shake it a little bit, mm -hmm. and the shaking motion is something that attracts them, because so, it is a, it is it signals to them um, there's a little struggle going on yes, it's with a, yeah. the food, and uh, I, you know that probably relates to uh, to a food species that yes. they're used to, that does that too, and uh, actually this this fast motion when you know that the trigger fish are somewhere hiding under a rock, but when you're when you're there and you you keep calm they. They will come out on that motion. You know? yeah. Well, that's that's tremendous, uh, Gilbert. Thank you very, very much for again sharing uh, sharing with us your, uh, your your lovely footage and then comparing the, the these two. Well, they're 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 visitors, but obviously perhaps uh, more regular visitors than some people yeah. thought, and more important uh, economically. And uh, I'm just pointing out the, the the differences in the feeding and the shapes and the activities and. Uh, and certainly it's uh, something that we really look forward to, uh, to seeing when you bring it. Well, you know, there's more to fish than, uh, than just eating them. Yeah. Uh, they, they are splendid creatures that yeah. have particular lifestyles. And when you're in there as a diver, you find out about that. And, and if you know a little bit more, it's uh, good to share that with, with other people that have a similar interest and just anybody. Well, thank you very much for sharing them with us. Pleasure.